Hey how you doing? Hope you all are doing great. As you seen in the thumbnail, in this video, we are gonna see, what if female Naruto was cold to everyone. This is part 2, and before getting into video. I request you to check the author of this fanfic, and show some love and support. Name of the story is. Kame by, Tualina, do check it out. All details in description. And if you want next part of this series. Please leave a like share, and consider subscribe. Let's get into the video. Also check out Petron for uncensored spicy content, link in description. The Kashi was about to finish the Buzo off when Senban struck the Kiri, missed, Nukunin, missing ninja. Thank you for the help. The figure wasn't much taller than the Kanoha Genin, about 5 1 feet, he was wearing featureless mask with the symbol for Kiri in the forehead, brown hair tied in a bun. They may could see Sakura gaping and Sasuke scowling. To be honest, she was put out as well. The Orakiri Oinen, missed Hunter Ninja. Kakashi muttered already feeling C, chakra exhaustion, taking its toll, but not showing a potential enemy any weakness. Yes. If you excuse me. And he vanished with a swirl of mist, Zabuza slung over his shoulder. The Kashi sensei Sakura carefully approached the Jounin, the battle still making her heart race and limbs tremble. Yes Sakura. That Oinen, Hunter Nin, was it? He couldn't be much older than us and yet. The Kashi just stared at her before muttering quietly and calmly, it's not uncommon to meet ninjas that are younger than you. And stronger than me. She gulped. Paddock san If he wasn't so tired Kakashi would have groaned. He had to find a way for Kamei to stop calling him that. Yes Kamei. That oinen he took the body with him. Kakashi's old visible eye widened before letting out a string of curses so vile that Sakura gaped and blushed and even Kamei and Sasuke could feel their eyebrows climbing. We can't do much right now, we need to take Tazuna sent to safety and then, but he didn't manage to finish. Like a puppet with its strings cut, Kakashi dropped to the ground. The Kashi sensei. Kamei scowled and almost didn't manage to stop herself from slapping her. The fight made her nervous and a lot less patience. He is fine. She snapped, and Sakura was still too jumpy to get angry. The pink-haired girl just stared at her fellow Kanoichi with wide eyes, he is just suffering from C. The blonde stared at Kakashi with analytical eyes. Many would just say it was simple exhaustion, but there were dark bruises like shadows under his eyes that weren't there mere 10 seconds ago, he was paler and seemed almost thinner. This was one of the most common causes ninjas landed themselves in the hospital. Beginner or not, chakra exhaustion was one of the first diagnoses Kamei learned to recognize, if only because of the number of times she saw it. The only thing to do was let the patient rest, not needing to perform any kind of irio medical procedure, if at times, give a high Oregon military ration pill, if severe. It seems that the Sharingan drained him. No wonder Kakashi had such an outstanding chakra control, he had to, considering his poor reserves well, for a Jounin in any case. Father. A young raven-haired woman hugged Tazuna hard enough that the three genin could hear the man's ribs creaking. She was pretty, but nothing that called attention in a large crowd, a quiet beauty. Hi, Tsunami, these are the ninja that I hired to bodyguard me. They introduced themselves with Tsunami not batting an eyelash to their ages, as she thanked them profusely, gasping when she saw the passed out Hattic Kakashi being carried by two of Kamei's Kage Bunshin. The Kashi groaned and tiredly opened his eye a few hours later, I really overdid it with the Sharingan this time. He tried to sit up only to fail and plop down again. Then you should be resting a young woman's voice called out. Tazuna was at the door along with a woman in her mid to late twenties. The Kashi sensei. Are you okay? He winced at the volume, and sure enough, Sakura was kneeing beside him with Sasuke and Kamei standing behind her. I will be, Sakura, but I won't be able to move around much for at least a week. He interrupted himself when Kamei stretched her arm. In the middle of her gloved palm a small dark brown sphere. A high Oregon, military ration pill, or as they are more commonly called, a soldier pill, Kakashi could feel his eyebrows climbing. Those are only available to Chunin in higher ranks. Where? I made them. She shrugged still holding the small pill. Kakashi could feel plain shock in his features. They were created by Senjutsuna Day in conjunction of the Nara and Akamichi Ichizoku clan. The Nara provided the right not to mention rare materials, the Akamichi imparted their knowledge in chemicals, and Tsuna Day actually confectioned the one of the most successful high organ used by a hidden village. Only losing for the ones Kusagakur, village hidden in the grass, uses because of the components. While not exactly difficult, the knowledge on how to make them was only revealed for those that were undertaking Iryo, medic training, how? An Iryo nin, medic ninja, taught me. She rolled her eyes. What? Did he think that she stole it or something or that it's chocolate, and she was hoping for some kind of placebo effect? 
but even if it replenishes a significant share of its user chakra and its backlash being nowhere near as violent as the ones used by most of the other villages, Kakashi would still be knocked unconscious after its energetic effects passed more or less by the end of the day, actually, I don't think this is a G. This is a lighter version. You'll get back in your feet, but not much more than that, there will be no backlash, but you can't take more than one each week, since it has properties of wild mushrooms and can have hallucinogen symptoms if constantly consumed. Kimei shook her arm, finally losing patience. Honestly, it wasn't like she was stupid enough to use something she wasn't sure of and knock out her poison their only chance of getting out of this mess alive and told him just that. Kakashi blinked owlish at her, both ignoring Sasuke and Sakura that were watching them like a tennis match. Giving a slightly embarrassed eye smile, Kakashi finally took the pill, and something seemed to catch his attention at the window behind them, because his eye got so comically wide that one would think he saw a ghost. As one all three genin and the two civilians at the door turned to see a small squirrel that froze under their eyes and took off like lightning, not before putting a small nut in its mouth that it was trying to eat before the strange humans gave it so much attention. Sweat dropping, the five turned to the genin only to see him happily crunching on the pill. The sweet drip got bigger. Seriously? The Jound in just eye smiled, feeling the familiar bitter taste of the high organ in his tongue and the familiar feeling of being startled awake in the middle of the night by a bucket of cold water that made you feel your heart rate speed up unpleasantly. But Kimei was right, the effects weren't as strong as a regular one, meaning the backlash will also be lessened. With a sigh, he propelled himself up, deciding to ignore the fact that his very green genin knew something that she shouldn't as per usual. Well, my kawaii genin. I think the Kimei already explained to you. Kimei Baka was trying to stir up problems like always. But don't worry sensei, Sasuke kun, and I didn't believe her. All three other members of Team 7 stared at Sakura while Kakashi was once again wailing on the inside. Why? What exactly did Kimei tell you? She said that Oinans, hunter ninjas, are usually tasked with tracking and killing Nukinans, missing ninjas, and they eliminate usually by fire the entire body on the spot, save for the head for confirming the kill, if that. Considering that the Oinan took Zabuza with him instead of just destroying his body, he is likely his ally and Zabuza is alive and being treated. Surprisingly, it was Sasuke that responded. Making it clear that while he may have his doubts as he didn't know much about Oinans and their MO, and also wasn't as paranoid as the blonde, he thought that Kimei's reasoning sounded probable, knowing that the blonde gets almost cross-eyed so much she reads and probably knew more history and theory than their teacher at the academy helped. Well she is right. The two genin and the jounin instructor cringe by the screech Sakura let loose. Tsunami-san and Tazuna-san were staring at her like they never heard something like that, almost forgetting to be frightened at the news that wouldn't be news if anyone had taken what Kimei said seriously. Not that anyone could be blamed for not taking the short 12-year-old seriously besides her teammates that is. Ignoring Sakura's rant, Kakashi absently rubbed the inside of his ear with his pinky, hoping it wasn't bleeding. That one was painful. What should we do? Kimei asked unfazed, but both Kakashi and Sasuke could see the nervousness in her usually calm eyes. Kakashi wasn't surprised, of all three genins, Kimei was the only that was seemly able to look at the long-term consequences. I estimate that Zabuza will be in good health in a week, meanwhile I will be training you guys Sakura looked skeptical, while Sasuke and Kimei just shot him deadpan looks. But sensei, what a week of training will do against an opponent like that. La, Sakura, any amount of training can save your lives. Real training. Kimei asked with the same skeptical look on her face as Sasuke Kakashi sweat dropped. The same day, they were deeper in the forest area with Kakashi leaning heavily in a crutch that was graciously offered by Tsunami-san, I will teach you how to climb trees. He I smiled just waiting for it and. What? Sakura's eyes bulged and Sasuke only glared, but there was a distinct sparkle of disbelief, and Kimei grimaced, but not for the reasons Kakashi was thinking. We already know how to climb trees. Without your hands and he demonstrated by walking up the nearest tree, crutch and all much to the astonished looks of two genins, the last one was too busy cursing in her head. Many would be shocked speechless for her crude vocabulary. Particularly if they ever had a single civil conversation with a low-voiced, polite and impressively articulate blonde. And she would say all out loud completely shamelessly if it wouldn't give her away. First, Kimei cursed her father. Blasted, motherfucking, hellish, bastard, idiotic, moron, naive of an airhead namak is Minato for sealing the QB in her, for literally choosing death when there were many other seals that could be used just as effectively as the Shaiki Fujin, dead demon-consuming seal, but Nuo, instead the asshole thought ah. 
I will use the one in my repertoire that need me to sacrifice my life, because it will be better this way, and then I will leave my only daughter completely alone and unprotected, after all. I will ask the villagers whose home was basically destroyed, and whose family and friends just died to treat her as a hero, because I have a fucking boner for death. And so, most of her education up to the point of Aruka sensei taking over, was sabotaged due to the ignorance of the imbeciles teaching at the academy. Bunch of useless little pests that came a would like nothing more than to slice into itty bit pieces, burn and scatter the fucking ashes. Then, she cursed the sand aimed useless fucking pushover that bends over for anyone that barks too loudly, and takes it up his ass so much that the pain must be too great for him to sit still, and actually goddamn listen to what people have to say, and actually doing fucking something for a dickwit of a change, the cursed dipshit that put the most incompetent pussy in Kanoha as a teacher. Oh, Kamei knew all about the Cyclops' skills and whatnot, but teaching skills. Bullshit. There is a huge difference between knowing how to do something and knowing how to teach it to someone else. And finally, of course, she cursed the one-eyed, Lamus, shit for brains, succus, retarded of a supposed teacher that was so useless and so imbecilic that he was only teaching them a fundamental part of being a genin, let alone a ninja four fucking months after everybody fucking else learned it. Of course, the blonde knew that saying all of this out loud wouldn't accomplish anything, but fuck. Grimacing, she was pulled out of her musings by Sakura's voice, for once not the glass-shattering kind. Hey, this is actually pretty easy. Blinking, the blonde looked up and there she was, Sakura was sitting in the highest branch of the very sizable tree. Heimei could feel her eyebrows rising, impressed. Her opinion that Sakura was worse than worthless or not, Kamei always gave credit when it was due. Haruno Sakura had a near-perfect chakra control. Thing was, that was mainly not to say only because of her toddler-like reserves, even then, insignificant reserves or not, getting it down on the first try, was impressive. In an impulse she couldn't curb in time, Kimei was actually opening her mouth to suggest that Sakura run up and down the tree to increase her chakra capacity, or even suggest that the girl trained in Jinjutsu when Kakashi beat her, well, Sakura is the strongest genin in Team 7. Looks like the Kanoichi and the Rookie of the Year are only talk. Sasuke's glare was so fierce that Kimei was surprised Kakashi didn't spontaneously combust it, while the blonde just rolled her eyes. She saw what Haddock Sand was doing, trying to goad in competitiveness, but considering everything, this would amount to nothing. Sasuke would only see the whole thing as another thing to obsess about, and also, he had the same opinion on Sakura that Kamei did. Cannon fodder, useless, loud mouth of a fangirl. Being told that she was stronger than him. Was Kakashi trying to push him over the edge? While Kamei was competitive, that went down the drain when Kakashi tried to compare Sakura to her. Impressive control. Of course, no one can deny that. But unlike most other 12-year-old, Kimei recognized that. Did she feel envy that something she struggles so much for acquiring comes naturally to Sakura of all people? Of course, but she didn't feel the least inclined to compete with Sakura on something so specific. Now if Kakashi's objective was trying to pit her against Sasuke, it could be slightly more effective if wasn't for the fact that both respected each other's abilities and knew each other's limitations due to the many times they trained together. Such as Sasuke's chakra capacity being quite smaller than hers, and consequently his control was better in this beginning of career stage, on the other hand, she was a lot more determined cough stubborn cough, and when putting something on her head, Kimei was very narrow-minded, and they knew it. So yeah, Kakashi. Kimei sweat dropped. Well, Sakura come with me, we will be guarding Tazuna-san while your teammates complete the exercise. They may watch they walk away, and only when she was sure they were out of earshot the blonde turned to Sasuke that was doing a backflip in order to land on his feet rather than his face after his first attempt. Hey, Sasuke. Why aren't you training? There was confusion with just a hint of incredulity. He knew her crazy training regimen that only a lunatic would try and only someone with her stamina wouldn't die of. So now that Kakashi, finally, was showing them something that was actually useful, he was confused why Kamei wasn't the first trying to go up the tree, and damn how that phrase sounded weird in his head, Sasuke made a mental note to never say it out loud. Kamei was contemplating the best way to go about it. She was pretty sure that saying I already know how to do it was a guaranteed way of fueling his temper, which was probably going to explode in her face on the other hand. What other way was there to say it? Clearing her throat, she tried to think in a way that would direct his, very likely, unstable reaction towards a more productive target, such as Sasuke himself. Someone with his ego problems needed a little self-hate. Remember four months ago when I tried to get you and Haruno-san to sign a formal complaint that would then provide us with satisfactory retribution towards Haddock-san's, less than stellar teachings, all the while giving us the professionals that would best suit and improve our fighting styles and mincets. Sasuke lifted an eyebrow. 
he had thought of it, but the idea of asking for someone's help, because that was essentially what that was, was kind like driving a hot poker trough his left eye, he had never been good at it and had no idea how to even do it. Kakashi was different, the man was legally obligated to train them. Yes. Well I met and began training with specialists in the areas of Jinjutsu, Tijutsu and Kinjutsu. Additionally, I also found out my chakra affinity and began training with an accomplished shinobi with the same nature. Kimei decided to divulge the whole thing least Sasuke finds out the extent of her new training regimen by other sources. What are you trying to say? The Achiha was beginning to see where this is going, was not liking it, and was already getting annoyed with Kimei beating around the bush. The blonde rarely, if ever, did that. Her long-winded explanations were a little frustrating for people that liked quick results, or answers as it were, but those were for the sake of context, this feels more like trying to avoid the subject. Yuuhi Kurinai is one of Kanoha's top Jinjutsu specialist, a newly turned Jounin, but quite competent, she taught me how to do this exercise in our first lesson together four months ago. As Kamei expected, Sasuke's expression was probably able to peel the paint off of a wall. Kamei gave all the hints and advices she could think of, and the detailed explanation Kurinai sensei gave her, why they did it and how to do it. And now what? He asked her after both lost count how many times he fell off in the sixth day doing it. As much as he loathed asking anyone for help, before Sasuke could even have the chance to rage, Kimei sent him a look so glacial that he could swear he felt his spine turning into ice, Sasuke didn't dare dismiss her. Flashes of all the tajutsu spars back in the academy going through his head kept his mouth firmly shut. You are still using too much chakra, and you are focused in the wrong things. She could see the bursts of chakra that were taking out chunks of the tree's bark. Focusing in the wrong things. What were you thinking when you were trying to walk up? He was thinking about Itachi. That man, he was always thinking about him. Every single training, every exercise, every practice, Sasuke was always thinking that this was a way of getting strong and finally avenging his clan. The finally cleansing the stain on the Ichiha name, that has been his whole motivation, the only reason to get up in the morning and face the reality that Sasuke would never again see his mother or father or the cousins he was closer to or the hundreds of other Ichihas ever again. Doesn't matter. He mumbled. Well, you are too fixated on whatever is it. Try to concentrate only in climbing the tree, divide a little of the attention to going up, overly focus on anything tenses you up. She snapped back without as much as a pause. That was why he did his version of befriending Kamei, Shino and Hinata. Unlike most people their age, particularly the girls, they didn't pry and not matter how annoying he found it, but by their knowing gazes, they deduce what was bothering him nine times out of ten. Sighing, Sasuke nodded and tried again. Meanwhile, Kimei was doing her own training, just because she mastered the three control exercises didn't mean she could stop. As Kurinai sensei explained, her reserves were still growing, and by the time her body was fully matured, at the peak of her physical condition, her chakra capacity will be many times the size that it is now. The thought gave her mixed feelings of giddiness and wanton groan and despair. Sandaim and Shadai both were railed for having an absurd amount of chakra, especially the Shadai, yet Senju Hashirama was still regarded as the best Iryonin, medic ninja, in history. Senju Tsunade, a chakra powerhouse herself was called by anyone, anywhere as the most skilled Iryonin in the world, and yet many still say, mostly the older generation that have memories of both, the Shadai and Senju Tsunade, that her prowess in the area pales in comparison to those of the Shadai, who had a lot more chakra than his granddaughter too. So Kimei knew that it wasn't impossible for her to have perfect chakra control, even with her reserves, but. Kimei sighed and almost pouted. Even after mastering it, every single time she did any of the three control exercises, the blonde still felt like she was trying to fit a dinosaur into a sake cup. She actually could do the damn exercise and it was getting easier, but very, very slowly. At least it wasn't like trying to make an ant drink a river's worth of water like it felt like when she started. The times, the Kanoichi asked herself if it took this long for the two Senju Irionins to possess such a godly control over so much chakra, and if they ever felt like pulling their own hair, until they had bold spots at the progress's snail-like pace. Morosely plucking a few leaves off of a bush she headed to the river to water walk, while making the leaves hover. After about three hours of that daily, the Kanoichi would cut leaves with Fuetin, Wind Release, Chakra, the first stage of the nature transformation training that she already completed in Kanoha, because even if she found a waterfall. Kamei wasn't idiotic enough to try the second stage, with the possibility of leaking Bijuu chakra, and so the blonde was trying to reduce the time it took to cut the leaves. Asuma-sensei didn't say anything, but it couldn't harm her progress, and if anything it could make the second stage easier. Three more hours and Kamei would then practice physical conditioning, and then the tajutsu stances Gai-sensei was teaching her, and trying to see a way to complement them with the kinjutsu, sword techniques, movements the blonde already got down. 
never trying to combine them since she didn't even know how to even commend such a thing and hate sensei, basically threatened her not to do anything stupid when he wasn't there to correct her. Soft-spoken, tease and kind or not, the older nin took kinjutsu very seriously. There wasn't any particular dangers when learning and training kinjutsu stances, the practice without any chakra and with wooden swords, but if she did the stances wrong too many times and it gets ingrained in her muscle memory, it would take a lot of effort to correct. Muscle memory can be both a nightmare and a blessing, since it helped you with well-honed reflexes and moves on the fly, but if the stances were wrong, then it was a bitch to correct something that your body was already used to doing, and so, Kamei only practiced the low to medium chuanin level stances that she already mastered. Already in an intermediary level in Tejutsu and ready to go for a few of the more advanced moves. Mid Chuanin if the scrolls Guy Sensei gave were to be believed, but since he wasn't there, the blonde was hesitant to begin those and screw up somewhere. She would wait until they were back in Kanoha to go deeper into the her studies in Irio Ninjutsu and Fu Ninjutsu, on account of being quite the heavy reading and the actual practice needing supervising or, in case of Fu Ninjutsu, a controlled environment that wouldn't matter all that much, if was destroyed by the sealer her frustrations and without Kurenai Sensei's help. Heimei was pretty much lost in Jinjutsu, but she could try and improve her chakra control. A few yards from there and looking at a tree, Sasuke tried to think of anything that didn't involve that man, when a memory that he almost forgot resurfaced. His father, Ichihafugaku, teaching the Katen. Gakaku no Jutsu, fire release. Great fireball technique to him, Sasuke remembered the determination not only to impress his father, but also to prove to himself that he was just as good as Nai as that man. It was almost ritualistic. He remembered the pride he felt, how he had to show his father the complete technique. Sasuke ran up a tree and this time he didn't fall. You're not heroes. You don't know anything about suffering. Of what we went through. You should just leave before Gato kills you all. Heimei and Sasuke couldn't believe that they were actually using earplugs because of a civilian, a bratty, eight-year-old civilian. The blonde was actually kind of amazed really. All three more serious members of Team 7 completely ignored the kid while Sakura shouted something at him. Seeing as he wasn't brave enough to scream at an adult's face, Inari targeted the three young genins, two of which didn't even look to be listening, and they really weren't, to the bafflement of the other two that still didn't know about the earplugs. After the very warm welcoming Inari gave them that first day that Kakashi was actually conscious, Sasuke and Kamei at least had the sense of steering clear of the brat, least they did something drastic. But seriously. They were tasked of protecting the brat's grandfather, his mother and him by proxy, and he basically told them they were incompetent and they should leave or they will die. The kid or not, the genins had to hold themselves back from punching the little punk. Considering the multitude of bullshit they would have to go through in case of violence against a client, Kimei and Sasuke smartly began using their earplugs. Ah, sweet silence. Finishing their lunch, they finally and very discreetly took their prized possessions off their ears when the circus of Sakura vs. Inari was over and the kid stomped off leaving a fuming pink-haired girl behind. Well, since I think both Sasuke and Kamei will master the exercise sometime today, tomorrow all of us will be going to the bridge and guard Tazuna-san. Kamei stole a glance at Sasuke, silently asking why he didn't say that he completed the exercise the day before about her new teachers. The boy just shrugged and hid a smirk behind his bowl of rice, Kakashi being on the other end of the table, didn't notice the very discreet gesture sent to her. The blonde hid her own smirk in response. It seems that the Achiha was finally catching on. To be honest no one cared much about the whole Kinoichi a rookie of the year once out of the academy, not the teachers, academy or Jounin, not the Hokage, nor other villages. It was mostly something to appease parents, civilians often liked this sort of thing. Hasten point. Hinata's father, the head of the Hayuga Ichizoku clan, could care less about the fact that Hinata wasn't Kinoichi of the year. But Kimei had to admit that in their class the title has a little more weight because of so many clan heirs graduating in a single go. Even then, once out in the shinobi world, the enemy hardly cared if you got a perfect score in history, just that you're in the way. Kimei perked up at the dimension of the bridge though. Drunken old man or not, Tazuna was talented, she thought remembering the huge construction. That got her thinking about the Uzumaki state. She didn't kid herself into thinking that reading about carpenter work and books made her a professional about building restorations. Despite all the improvements she's done in the main building, the one she has been living in since she was a starved five-year-old, there were many things that the Kanoichi had no idea how to go about like repairing the window's glass, changing the broken linoleum in the kitchen and the bathrooms, fixing the wiring and the plumbing in one of the houses. See what was wrong with the cooker hooder repairing the roof's tiles. Those needs aside, the blonde was uneasy with the thought of anyone besides herself in the Yuzumaki compound. That place became heaven to her when she was even more defenseless than she was now. 
Kimei knew that she didn't stand a chance against a more experienced medium Chunin, Mizuki didn't count, let alone a Jounin, back then. An academy student would be able to land her in the hospital. It was after one of the more brutal beatings, October 10, it was always worse on that day. Kimei remembered running. Running by pure willpower, the pain and blood loss long impaired her vision, a tiny hand holding the deep slashes across her ribs. All she thought, all she could do was run away, run away from the people that would certainly finish the job if she stopped. What she never knew was that in the second she stepped foot outside the village's parameters, the Hokage's crystal ball activated, but could no longer see her, since its limits were exactly the village's. Hiruzen sent various Anbu squads, captured, imprisoned and sent the offenders to Yamanaka Inoichi, the head of T&I, torture and interrogation, back then, and tried to find her, but by then she was already within the safety of the Uzumaki compound. When her legs could no longer support her weight, Kimei tipped forward and had to lean in a great wall that was covered in moss and taken by nature. Looking up, she saw that it was very, very tall, taller than the Kanoha's gates. Underneath all the plants that grew because of the absence of the property's owners, the little blonde could see strange black writings, in front of her they were really tiny, complicated and intricate, but to her left, they began to get a little bigger, words beginning to be recognizable. She couldn't read, but a few of the symbols were a little familiar, she understood the key and zoo in katakana, both being in her name. Fearful, but having nowhere else to go, she held her wounded torso and began to follow the wall to her left, a heavy limp slowing her, but it would be a very long walk with her without the handicap. The words and symbols, before smaller than the tiniest ant, now were the size of her fingers and getting bigger, by the time they were twice the size of her hand, the size of an adult's hand, she walked for long hours, and the sun was just beginning to set. The attack happening in plain daylight, but to her it was the normal, so therefore Kimei didn't see the horrifying aspect of it all. Tired and in a lot of pain, Kimei looked up when the symbols stopped being horizontal and began to go up, almost as if they were being held and sucked by the very light blue almost white swirl in the gakuzuka of the huge tori gates, as if the writings were drawn curtains. Traditional Japanese gates, gakuzuka is a supporting strut, usually covered by a plate with a similar name. She didn't know, but the QB was already working to heal her. A lot slower than it would if she was an adult or even a little bigger, since there was just so much chakra a tiny body like hers could contain, and so, Kimei was able to lift her bloodied hand, and like any curious child that she was so strongly denied to be. The blonde pressed her hand in the middle of the gates where there was only a lone column of tiny white swirls. The second that her blood touched the swirls, they began to spin and all the symbols, from the great white one in the gakuzuka to the writings in the walls began to move, the swirl began to spin, and like snakes, the writing would contort, move back and forth, and then stop. Startled and more afraid than she ever thought was possible, Kimei began to get up from where she had fallen in her fright. With a noise of rock being moved, the gate slowly opened, moss, leaves and webs dropping from the middle, and making the opening slower than it normally was, it was clear that the place was abandoned for many years. Looking around, Kimei knew that she couldn't return to the village, she probably wouldn't make it with her injuries, and she could come face to face with her attackers. Stilling herself, the young girl hoped that the place was truly abandoned like it looked. It clearly has been neglected for years, plants growing in what was once a beautiful courtyard. The tiles forming a picture of waves that formed a spiral in the middle of it, it was covered by dust and shattered in a few places by the growing vines, a granite fountain in the center of the swirl, vines growing around it. There were ten huge houses on each side, traditional style, raised floors with tatami, shoji doors, columns outside, with enough space between one and another that each of them had a reasonably sized garden and even delicately fenced. The twenty houses lined the big and flat stones paved highway towards a main building, almost twice the size of the other buildings. Aimei was close to the fountain when the huge gate slowly closed. Without knowing anything about the symbols, she saw how they had the same pattern on the inside and knew that if she pressed her hand in the same place, the doors would open again. Unknowingly displaying quite the instinct and knowledge in fuinjutsu, sealing techniques that even those trained in the area were hard-pressed to display. Too tired to do much exploring, she went to the closest residence, thanking her luck that it was unlocked. She entered a living room, and as the size outside indicated, it was very spacious. Once it could have been called luxurious, but time clawed at the rich fabrics and expensive ornaments, however Kimei figured that bases and the likes were probably conserved. Thinking back at the orphanage she was just kicked out of, she knew that the matron had a med kit in the kitchen, and the kitchen is usually located near the living room. Going to the closest door, Kimei found herself staring at quite the impressive oven, the pans hanging in hooks above the aisle, a low and traditional table in front of a double-door fridge. Searching through the cupboards, the blonde found what she was looking for. 
a medium-sized white box with a red cross in the middle and a handle in the surface, everything inside were all probably past their expiration date, considering the dust that was covering everything really, but the child didn't have any other choice. She remembered the matron taking care of one of the kids that got hurt, the nasty woman didn't know Kame was eavesdropping, so she explained step by step what she was doing to the hurt and curious kid that cut himself with a miniature sword-shaped letter opener while playing ninja. The young Yuzumaki gingerly shed her second-handed and two big clothes. The threadbare black masculine t-shirt that was twice her size was completely ruined, but its dark color still masked how much blood she lost, and Kame could only wince when she saw her torso, where those women in charge of the orphanage sliced her with butcher knives. There were quite a few in her back, but those didn't hurt as badly as the ones in the front. She could clearly see her flesh, it was deep enough, and the sight was almost enough to make her lose consciousness, taking deep breaths like the blonde remembered the matron instructing that kid to do, Kame tried to calm down. First clean the wound. Like that kid that was playing around in the yard, the cuts were covered by dirt and blood, she searched through the box and found the sterile gloves, they were too big, but the child still recalled that woman explaining the danger of infection just by touching the wound with their bare hands. A quick glance around the box's contents, and she was relieved when she saw the different colored labels and different shaped bottles. Not being able to read, Kame could easily put the wrong thing in the wrong place. Trying to see if there was anything inside the wounds, she couldn't detect anything, so she got the brown plastic bottle with the light blue label. Peroxide. It was still sealed, so Kame knew that it didn't lose too much of its purpose, putting in a piece of cotton she started rubbing the slashes. It stung horribly, but the Yuzumaki felt a lot worse, she gritted her teeth not to scream and cleaned very carefully every single gash. When the strongest waves of pain were over, the child dried the excess of peroxide tiredly but purposely. Seeing that although deep it wasn't bleeding anymore, it was time to close the wounds. There was a paste tube inside an orange packing. Antibiotic ointment. She couldn't recall what it was for, but it was important so Kame ripped the pack again, opened the tube and put some in every gash, it didn't hurt too much, she found the packet of butterfly bandages and carefully closed each cut. Finally, she had to dress the wounds. Getting the adhesive tape and cutting small stripes, the child got rolls of clean bandages and put a few layers in each cut, holding them in place with the tape. Brained from the pain, she slumped against the low table where she put everything. Taking in a deep breath, Kame summoned whatever was left of her energy and got up. In one of the drawers, she found old dish towels and cleaned a relatively small square of the dirt covering the table and the ground of the kitchen. Too tired to even bother with the fact she was shirtless, she succumbed to sleep. The next morning, the small child was feeling a lot better, the QB and her Yuzumaki blood taking care of her lacerations. They were still pretty nasty, but they didn't hurt as much as the day before, so she searched the rooms of every house, but only the main and the closest ones to it were used, even if all of them were well stocked with med kits. Furniture and everything else a person might need besides personal items like toiletries, clothes, books and the likes. In the main house, Kame found quite a few pictures of the apparently past owners. The first that caught her attention instead of just gazing right through was that of a young girl, a couple of years older than herself, perhaps seven or eight. She had deep red hair the color of a rose that reached mid-thighs. Since no one ever bothered to cut Kimei's hair, hers was longer, reaching her knees, but both had very straight silk-like threads that was parted to the side, hers always got into her eyes, but the girl in the picture didn't have the same problem. Her bands were carefully cut to delicately frame her round face, she was wearing a purple battle kimono with a sash a shade darker. Yellow sleeves that reached her elbows and a skirt in a very dark blue. Her eyes were the most amazing shade of amethyst. The girl was with a hesitant smile on her face, standing close to an elderly woman who was tall and had very long hair that had a red undertone. Kame was willing to bet it was very red when she was younger, the same tone of the girl's probably, two buns on each side of her head, with the rest of her mane falling down her back. A purple gem in her wrinkled forehead and dressed in a formal white kimono with a purple sash, she had a very kind expression. The next picture had the same young Redeed, a few years older. She was grinning and standing behind a boy the same age who was equally happy and whose blonde hair was spiking at every possible direction, blue-eyed and wearing a white hoodie with blue stripes in the sleeves. Both were wearing a shiny new Kanoha metal band on their foreheads that Kame sometimes saw people using. Kame blinked and came back to the present. She could hear Sasuke trying to walk up and down the three slowly, testing his control a few meters from there. Shaking her head a little, she tried to shoo the memories away. She stayed in the Yuzumaki compound for an entire week, exploring the grounds, eating the fruit she could find, and the more resistant vegetables that were taking over the grounds. The main house was located at the edge of a low highland, behind and below there was a giant hill divided in sections, she could see what used to be a plantation, gardens, and further away separated by a huge grapevine, and surrounded by the random dummy practices. 
what used to be a training area. A month later, the Hokage finally found her. Very far away from the Yuzumaki compound and the village, trying to fish in a stream. A very guilty looking Sandame enrolled her in the academy and got her an apartment, and two years later, she met Aruka sensei. Squaring her shoulders, the Genin focused in the exercises of the day. Panting and sweating, the Genin still had it in her to swipe a kunai and get in a defensive stance at the sound of a twig breaking. They may almost did a double take. Holy. She could feel her eyebrows rising, and no one would be able to blame her. This is probably the most beautiful person she ever met, and despite her almost indifference towards her own appearance and the disdain she feels whenever she heard those girls back at the academy, and now just Sakura wasting hours to no end on their looks, Kamei couldn't help but feel her self-esteem get a punch in the face. At first glance everything would indicate a girl. From the long silky hair to the full lips and long lashes framing two wide brown eyes and elegant eyebrows and the pink kimono. But there was something in the features the cheekbones a little too noticeable to belong to a woman, still aristocratic and graceful, but boyish. As much as Kamei herself had muscles from her vigorous training, hers were leaner than the ones under the pale peach skin that were only visible when the person moved the arms. The pink fabric of the female clothing was also a little too open for a girl that would wear such prudish clothes in the first place, and chest area too flat for someone a few years older than Kamei herself. Independently of Sakura that even taller than Kamei and whose body should already have begun developing being flatter than a board Kamei, blinked and sighed lightly while closing her eyes for just a second. It seems that coexisting with Haruno-san for so long has induced her into making inane observations like this. Either way she had no idea if this person in front of her was a boy or a girl, and that only added to the alien feeling of having one's self-esteem becoming roadkill. Never paying attention to anyone's appearance, hers included, now Kamei is coming to the annoying realization that she did care. Great. Oh, sorry, I didn't know there was people here, smooth and penetrating voice, the blonde thought. And still no hint about gender, the genin had already met androgynous people, but this is just ridiculous. Please don't mind me. I am not a local, so I am the one intruding. Kamei wasn't revealing anything that anyone who lived in the area wouldn't be able to conclude just by looking at her. Short-sleeved pale yellow battle kimono with mesh underneath held close by a thick black obi, black shinobi pants tucked in black high boots without heels. Long, golden blonde hair tied to a low-sided ponytail that was nowhere near common in Nami, wave, very blue eyes and naturally tanned skin, her blue head a tight in her forehead and keeping her bands away from her face. Oh, thanks, I was just about to collect some herbs. This caught her interest. As a medic trainee, Kimei knew that the field they were in had some plants that were able to speed healing. Are you a medic? This made her him pause. I am a healer, yes, and this hit eight. Are you perhaps a ninja? Yes, she answered carefully. Never mind the fact that she he this person was wearing civilian outfit. It was never a sin to be extra careful with hostile ninjas just looming around the corner and in foreign soil, not that she really needed to since she was wearing a Kanoha hit eight. Well here she looked like a local, knowing where to find these plants and walking with purpose, and with the Gato situation with hired Nukunin, missing ninja, made Kimei remember the law of conquest, what if she? Were you training? The soft voice made her snap to attention and curse herself at the same time for being so absent-minded in the middle of a mission. She must be more tired than she thought. Um yes, I was. But you already look really strong, why train so hard? The question made her pause. Her first thought was that civilians were too easy to impress, but if Kamei was honest with herself, the only reason she even wanted to be a ninja in the first place was to be able to protect herself. If she could fight back then the attacks would stop, that was why she didn't say anything when the Sandame enrolled her in the academy, Kamei almost scoffed, back then she didn't even know that she didn't actually have a choice in the matter of becoming a ninja. Was there even something like a civilian Jinchuriki? But the blonde managed to avoid the attacks just by being clever. Taking scenic routes, using her knowledge of the laws and intelligence, is not an exclusively ninja trait, despite her experience with civilians. What about now? What was her motivation for training so hard? Why was she putting so much effort into it anyway? Even taking pride in her skills and feeling derision for those silly girls back at the academy. Heimei didn't know what prompted her to answer such a question to a complete stranger, but this stranger was the first person that asked her motivations in her life. I don't know. The words were out before she put much thought into them which was something that Kamei thought she had grown out of. The response made him or her surprised and Kamei hastily tried to explain herself, even knowing that she didn't own any satisfaction to a stranger, but it's just the original reason is no longer applicable. She grimaced. The stranger then tilted his or her head in thought. Do you have anyone important to you? What was it with this girl guy and his or her infuriating questions? Kamei was perfectly fine without anyone in her life asking her stuff like that. 
That being sad or not notwithstanding, and as much as she would like to just turn on her heels and walk away, Kamei prided herself in her education, since it was something that the majority of Kanoha's population seemed to lack. Important. The first person that she could ever put in that classification was Yumino Ruka-sensei, Kamei knew that she owned him a lot more than she could ever repay. In second place, but in first in terms of chronological order were Ichiraku Tuchi and his daughter, A.M. because in spite of the fact that both were civilians and in perfect age to know what she was and despise her for it, they were kind, kinder to her than even their other clients. They may just couldn't understand how they could be so glaring of an exception, she still remembered the day she first met them. It was already dark, and it was raining so much that only the few occasional ninja could be found jumping from a rooftop to another, so no one was around to watch a tiny, malnourished four-year-old girl dressed in what was clearly boys' clothes. Long-sleeved green t-shirt and a short-sleeved white one over it, with a red swirl and dark blue shorts, walking aimlessly through the streets. The matron found a broken lamp in one of the rooms and punished Kamei for breaking it. It didn't matter that Kamei didn't even know the existence of the room and couldn't possibly reach the box of lamps in the highest cupboard. She was kicked for the night without dinner and a very poor lunch, but that was the normal there. That was the usual punishment, not that Kamei knew it, but the matron didn't want to risk the Hokage finding out and kicking her out for good, but the old woman was starting to become bolder, more aggressive and angrier. Kamei wasn't even bothered by the rain, already used to even sleep under it. Her very long hair was already drenched as were her clothes when she came face to face with the only commercial building on the entire street that was still open. It was relatively small if compared to other restaurants and shops in the village, no tables, just a stand with stools. The scent that was coming from behind it was so mouthwatering that she couldn't help but approach a little, putting a hand on the wall and staring a little wistfully as a man in a wide apron and matching cook hat stirred noodles in the water. With his back was to her, she didn't have to worry about flying objects or being chazzed out. They may watched as the cook put a generous amount of noodles in a bowl and began artfully arranging other ingredients in it. She was so distracted that when he spun around and blinked at her, she didn't even notice, but she did notice when he made a notion with his hand, Kamei startled and bolted, but froze when the cook's words reached her. Don't you want to sit? Back then, she was still a little too trusting, how many people have faked kindness just to get close enough for a chance of hurting her. But that was still the first time someone has ever showed her kindness. The warm voice and amiable words stopped her in her tracks. Hesitantly, Kamei took a step back and showed her face, when all the man did was give her a smile and offer her a sit again, the tiny blonde wandered and sat on the a little too high stool. Kamei still felt warm whenever she remembered that day. A.M., then just a little more than a child herself, came over and one look at her, scolded her father, Tucci, for not bringing anything warm to her. She wrapped a fluffy white towel around her shoulders and another one on her head and helped her father prepare the rest of the noodles, before Kamei could even say anything else, they put a steaming bowl of ramen in front of her and smiled kindly. She stared at the bowl in wonder, blue eyes shining beneath drenched blonde hair, and beamed at the duo that was waiting for her opinion on their pride dish, and it wasn't until after she was long gone that Kamei realized they never charged her, and even at four, the blonde had quite the appetite. Yes, she answered finally. Thinking back at Tucci and A.M. and after them, Aruka sensei yes. Kamei repeated with a stronger voice, I do have people in my life that are important to me. The stranger nodded and gave her a soft smile. When a person has something important they want to protect that's when they can become truly strong. Sucking a slight breath, Kamei looked up and staring into warm brown eyes, she sighed. So you are saying that my motivation should be those that I care about. When the only answer she got was a smile, Kamei almost laughed, catching herself just in time, but she did let Scape a soft chuckle and got a laugh in return too. Well I believe so, yes. Thank you. This time she was the one to startle the stranger. What for? I try hard not to mix the different parts of my routine. That independently of how much I value those that are close to me, I actually didn't put them into consideration in other aspects so thank you, you made me realize that they don't have to necessarily be excluded from everything that is not directly related to them. Wide brown eyes blinked and full lips parted slightly before forming a happy smile. Then, you're welcome. They may smiled, her shoulders never felt lighter, and she never even noticed how tense they were her entire life. The blonde even offered help in collecting the herbs, and when they were parting the fascinating stranger turned to her, something almost sad in the brown gaze. You will become very strong and we will meet again, someday. Thank you again, also if you don't mind me, asking Kamei was feeling really awkward with the question she was about to make, but her curiosity was almost eating her insides by this point. However the stranger seemed to know what the blonde was curious about, because with an amused if slightly frustrated sigh, the soft voice answered her. I'm a boy. Kamei wasn't sure if that made her feel better or not. The next day Kakashi tasked her to leave a few clones behind and guard the house. 
They were almost at the bridge when she got its memories back, only Kakashi noticed the very faint bemused smile on her face. They may didn't know what prompted her to get personally involved. She already dispatched a henchman samurai wanted, and so she should already have dispelled herself, perhaps the encounter from yesterday mollified her, but she supposed that the brat and Ari earned it when he tried to protect his mother, knowing full well that both would end up dead. The job, Inari, she just couldn't help herself. But but I couldn't do anything. If you weren't here we we would. Perhaps. But you tried and showed a great deal of courage doing that. I think that today, you just became your mother's hero. Inari turned to his mom that was looking at Kame gratefully before looking back at him. So full of pride, so impressed and and how someone looked at a hero. In that moment one little boy looked at Kame as if she could do anything, as if the sun rose and set, because she willed it to do so. Kame sighed, uncomfortable and not knowing what to do with this new development. The last person to send a look like this to her was Hinata, and the Hayuga was slowly beginning to realize that she was human and had faults of her own that didn't stop the admiration, but fortunately it did stop the almost reverence. The clone dispersed in a small puff of smoke which, unknowingly to Kame, only added to the otherworldly image Inari had of her. Quickly and silently, Kame explained to Kakashi the situation back at Tazuna Sen House with Tsunami San and Inari, leaving out her little pep talk. We are here. Sakura, guard Tazuna San. Sasuke and Kame you will take on the fake Oinen, Hunter Ninja. His use of Senbon Needle mid-battle is advanced and impressive, but I think he must be Chunin level, more skilled and dangerous than the Demon Brothers, but Chunin level nonetheless. What Kakashi didn't expect was Kame realizing that the skill to throw Senbon at that kind of distance and hit a nerve that would render the target not unconscious but in a death-like state was a Jounin level movement. She already heard from Gai Sensei that a Tajutsu style that hit precise points of the body to render them useless needed years to reach a level that would be useful in real battle situations. That is part of the reason the Hayuga were so feared, with their Byakugan they could pinpoint not a weak spot but damage their inner, very soft and vulnerable organs. If being able to do that with their own hands in practice was already considered a high Chuanin level of skill in Tajutsu, what did it say about someone that was able to do that mid-battle with goddamn Senmen? Probably part of the reason that Kakashi was saying he was a Chunin level was to give them a confidence burst, or because the fake Oinen didn't immediately engage in combat when Kakashi was weakened. A fair assessment, but Kimei had a nagging feeling at the back of her head that was telling her that the accomplice was just worried for Mamachi's abusa, which no one would think because of the bloody habits of Kiri, Mist, Nin. Even then, Kakashi was a Jounin, so he probably picked up far more details than she did, as it was, it wasn't like she had other choice but to trust his analysis. What happened here? Tazuna almost shouted. The few workers that had enough courage to keep building the bridge were sprawled in the ground. A quick assessment and Kakashi was already able to tell that they were only unconscious, probably an intimidation tactic, and then the same technique that was used before they reached Nami, Wave, began spreading. Harigakur no Jutsu, hidden mist technique, as the name implied, diffused a mist so thick that they couldn't see a mere inch from their faces, they could barely see each other. So, Kakashi, round two. Mamachi's abuser's voice mocked from within the mist that cleared just enough to reveal his masked accomplice. Sasuke, Kame. Kakashi ordered to which both Jenins nodded and advanced towards the masked nin. For Jenins those two take themselves way too seriously, Zabuza commented lightly. I'm afraid that your companion will not survive. Oh? Don't underestimate Haku. He is different from those brats of yours, he is different even from me or you. Kame and Sasuke were already facing the masked figure. Please, surrender now. I do not wish to kill either of you. His voice was muffled by the mask, but Kame frowned with a strange sense of deja vu. Where was this feeling coming from? Nonsense, Sasuke was the one to answer. The smirk on his face at the chance to test himself against a fake Oinin, Hunter Nin, both already trading blows while Kame just observed a few feet away, her arms crossed. She is a lot more calculating than this boy. She is carefully analyzing everything I'm doing and is calm enough to do so effectively while her teammate fights that moment at the glade I underestimated her. They may baka. Do something. Sakura, shut up, Kakashi ordered much to the surprise of all three students. It was one of the first times that he actually sounded like a jounin. But it was also the first time Kakashi was seeing Kame in a fight of this level. Just like Minato-sensei, she is letting her companions do their will, but stands close enough just in case they need her help. All the while not pulling her eyes off of the enemy, the way she is focusing mainly on the limbs and muscle movement, Kame is trying to find a pattern. Sensei, Kishina-san, you'd be proud. I am already two steps ahead. The boy stated when he and Sasuke got in a stalemate, the fake in once using Senban to block his kunai. Two steps ahead. First. 
We are surrounded by water, he gestured to their feet, the floor of the bridge covered in many big puddles, and second. I blocked one of your hands. He then did something that made all four Kanohen in widen their eyes, he brought his unoccupied hand up and began to do one-handed seals. But the Kimei couldn't help herself. She thought it was a fucking myth. She read about it a few months ago about singular skills. That thick book contained from extinct clans to lost techniques. Most of it sounded far-fetched, but it was a good basis to create your own original jutsus, even if she did treat it like fantasy. What she was seeing was very real. The Kashi was in a similar state of chalk. He is doing one-handed seals. I never even saw something like that. Suiten. Sensatsu Susho, water release. Thousand deadly water needles. Haku stomped lightly in one of the puddles, and in a second, the water that was innocently laying in the ground rose into the air, twirled and formed hundreds perhaps even thousands of water senbans, all aimed at Sasuke that although pressed, seemed to be more concentrated than worried. The second all the water senbans charged in his direction, Sasuke disappeared. Using his training in the tree walking exercise to expel a huge quantity of chakra at the bottom of his feet to propel himself away. They may raised an eyebrow. Psychological issues or not, Sasuke aren't being called a genius. She thought watching the fake coin and being kicked in the face and lading near Zabuza, everybody ignoring the squeal Sakura let out. Haku, you know what to do, the Nukinen, missing ninja, said. Yes, Haku replied, and he was shrouded by a blue flame no Kame squinted. It was chakra, but she never saw something of the like. Is it becoming colder? She wasn't the only to think that, Kakashi, Sakura and Sasuke were also looking around. It's a pity. Haku stated and did a hand seal that looked like a crossed aura tiger, and whispered with a strong voice. Hyoten. Makyo Hayashu, ice release. Demonic mirroring ice crystals. The ice began to shape parallelepiped forms, twelve surrounding Kame and Sasuke, eight blocking their upper exit with a single one facing the ground. What jutsu is that? They heard Kakashi whispering to himself. Haku just calmly walked to nearest structure and entered it much to the shock of the Kanoha observers. His image appearing in all of the 21 blocks of ice. Giving the name of mirrors of the technique. Damn it. Kakashi tried to rush to his students, but Zabuza blocked his way. I'm your opponent, yes. Well once that jutsu is activated, your students are goners. Hearing that, Kimei finally moved from her crossed arms position and discreetly touched her left wrist, in what people would assume as a nervous habit of tugging her mesh sleeve, but in reality she was deactivating the chakra weights Guy sensei gave her. Shaking her shoulders to get used to the new lightness in her body, she grabbed two kunais, holding them in a reverse grip and bending her knees, while positioning herself at Sasuke's back. However, that didn't matter, there were too many mirrors to keep track of. The gen and almost huffed in grim amusement, that meant that the attack could come from any of them or every single one of them at the same time if it had the ability. The blonde realized why Zabuza had so much confidence in this particular jutsu, probably only trained not to mention fast by Akigan users, and at least high Chuanin level ninjas would be able to defend themselves against it. She even doubted that the Sharingan would be much use, predicting movements in their field vision was well and fine, but that meant shit if the user was attacked from behind. Besides, Sasuke didn't awaken his, so that was a moot point. Kimei scowled a little. So, I shall show you my true speed. And Haku began to throw dozens of senbin from all directions, from every mirror. Cursing under her breath, Kimei applied every single trick hate sensei taught her. Kinjutsu users' opponents often targeted their swords because leaning so heavily in a weapon could be detrimental in other areas. Most assume that if a swordfighter was without their sword, they were weakened, and while that was true enough, Hei sensei taught her how to improvise if that ever happened. Regardless of a kunai's shorter reach, this Haku already proved in their first encounter that he had an astounding aim, besides, Kimei's objective wasn't attacking, but defend herself. So her weapon's reach didn't matter in the short term of the fight, when they didn't even know a way out of this dome. Taking a deep breath, the blonde genin concentrated and tried to keep up with the attack. It was damn difficult, senbans are too tiny and thin, it was already hard to see them mid-thrown, blocking them was almost impossible, and she was only managing because the technique resulted in Haku, or his reflection as it was. Needing to be more or less close Okamei could see his hand's movements to predict where the senban would hit. Twisting and twirling her body, when her kunais couldn't catch the senban in time and to try and watch for every mirror, Kimei was using all her natural flexibility and the speed her arduous training provided her, pushing both to the limits. The blonde was moving her wrists and her arms as fast as she possibly could, deflecting the battle needles with her kunais, and sending a silent thanks for Guy sensei and Hei sensei, because their training was a godsend, blue eyes glaring from the effort, and almost fluttering from trying to see every mirror, her brows set in a hard expression. 
Zabuza, Kakashi, Sakura and Izuna could only gape at the display of skill, the genin and the civilian only being able to see a blur where her arms should have been. Metallic clings could be heard, one after the other, in such rapid succession that it sounded more like a very strong rain. Haku had a hell of a name, but his strength was also nothing to laugh at by the cracks that dodged Senbans made in the concrete ground of the bridge, and Kimei could already feel her arms straining from the tiny but powerful throws that she had to intercept with her blades and. That was saying something after all her lunatic strength training and trainer. Independently of her speed and her skilled kinjutsu, sword technique, stances, Kimei couldn't possibly keep an eye on every 21 mirrors and every half a dozen of senbans that were fired from each of them at the same time, so a few ended up passing her defense, fortunately nowhere vital. But shit if those few that hit her didn't hurt like a stab wound, but smaller and focused in a single point, which only hurt even more. When her arms were already feeling more like pudding instead of flesh and bones, the Feikoinen finally stopped his attack. He also seemed surprised by his body language, since his face was hidden by the mask. Breathless and in a lot of pain, and also suppressing the urge to shake her arms to try regaining feeling in them, determined not to show that weakness, lest it be explored and pretending that she could have done that all day, Kimei straightened her stance. Ignoring her gaping spectators and calmly plucking the few senbans that made it past her defensive movements. Each time refusing to wince at the sting and with a perfectly compassed expression that didn't betray an ounce of the pain she was feeling. But she couldn't ignore Sakura's shrill, usually it only made her eardrums throb, and, in one more spectacular occasion, bleed. But this time the words made a chill ran down her spine not so much the words, since they were no news, but the panic in them. Sazuke kun Oh. Fuck. Blue eyes widened and naturally tanned skin paled. Absently taking out the last senbin that was in her shoulder, this time not even needing to suppress the urge to wince because of the dread that was weighting her down, Kimei slowly turned. Almost not being hit in her back, the genin just assumed that Sasuke was also successful in blocking the needles well, he was, but not in the way Kimei would have preferred. There, lying at her feet was a Chiha Sasuke that more resembled a porcupine at the moment. Oh. Fuck. Kimei could hear both Kakashi and Sakura shouting Sasuke's name, but she was a little too busy gawking. Did the Ichiha at least try to block the Senbans? Kimei winced at the thought, not his fault she basically neglected her teammate, but so his fault that he didn't even prepare to block. When she was twisting her body to dodge when she couldn't block, the blonde saw Sasuke moving, but she guessed that, not being fast enough, he was dodging the damn things, which, Kimei cringed, was somewhat on her, if he was dodging why the hell so few Senbans hit her in the back in the first place. Oh. Fuck. So. Not. Good. He was still breathing, his chest rising and falling rapidly. Kimei made a quick count of the needles and winced again when she got to the twenties, but at the least at first glance exam, it didn't hit anything vital, but it did hit many nerves, damn, that got to hurt like a bitch, and it only spoke volumes about Haku's aim, and somewhat on his weird compassion with enemies. Anyhow, Kimei wasn't about to question her luck that her first real opponent in a real battle the Demon Brothers didn't count as far as she was concerned, had such a weird code of honor that was almost an awkward trait for a ninja to possess. Without thinking much, the blonde hastily removed all the senbans, Sasuke hissing in pain. Please, stand down, I do not wish to kill you. Helping Sasuke to his feet, Kimei tried to calm her mind while ignoring Zabuza's companion. It often happened back then, when the attacks were frequent and she didn't know what to do. Kimei remembered that her brain was always firing image after image, thought after thought, never being able to stand still in a single one, and yet never giving her a headache. She remembered reading about the Yuzumaki biology, how their brain cells were a hundred times faster than a normal person's, and so, it was a hundred times harder to focus. Coupled with their ridiculously high stamina and chakra reserves, it made many people outside of the clan to think they had hyperactivity. That was the consequence of their biology and not the cause of their behavior. When adrenaline started pumping, their brain, until that moment dormant in a way, went into hyperdrive, taking in too many details at the same time. Taste, feeling, hearing, scent, sight. Everything was being computed all at once in every possible detail that most people don't even pay attention, and a Yuzumaki that was never taught how to process all of it in a way that would make sense would be overwhelmed and freeze, not knowing what decision to make with all the information their brain was receiving. They needed to go through a rigorous training regimen of concentration and hone their reflex to their limits. But when completed, a well-trained, experienced Yuzumaki could think in a counter-movement at the same time they were receiving the data in the first place. Their abilities in view and jutsu, sealing techniques, may have been what riled up Kiri, Mist, Iwa, Rock, Taki, Waterfall, and Tani, Valley, into attacking, but their prowess was why it took half an army of two of the shinobi Gadokoku, five great shinobi countries, with two minor villages backing them up to destroy Yuzushio. 
but the Yuzumaki decimating every single one of their attackers in the process and managing to delay them enough for quite a few survivors to flee. Taking a deep breath, Kimei tried to organize her muddled thoughts and slow her heartbeat that was clogging her ears. How? Sasuke muttered in her ear, the proximity inevitable due to Kimei needing to support his weight, but to her it sounded so far off. She didn't dare to try and perform the Shosen Jutsu, mystical palm technique. In her state of mind, Kimei would be lucky if she only severed their nerves, hers and the Achihas, regardless of whom she tried to perform it on. With a heavy tongue, she tried to answer. Training, it sounded mumbled even to her ears, but the Achiha only snorted. So, you still wish to fight? The voice was almost sad. Unfortunately, we have no choice, Kimei answered calmly. Very well, Haku prepared a new set of sendments. Can you stand? She whispered to Sasuke who only rolled his eyes and pushed himself off of her. Somehow it's getting a little easier to keep track of his movements. Kimei raised an eyebrow and looked at her teammate at the corner of her eyes, his eyes they were very dark blue, practically black and in the light, had a slight grey undertone, but now they were almost reddish. She almost huffed, so he was almost awaking the Sharingan after all. Try to at least block the Senbans with a kunai instead of your body this time around, she wasn't disdaining him, and he knew it. Sasuke only smirked and quickly took two kunais out, holding them in a reverse grip like Kimei was doing. Well let's not give the kids all the fun, shall we, Kakashi? Ada Kakashi was still marveling at Kimei's movements. Where did she learn such a thing? Blocking shurikens and kunais was one thing, he remembered Minato-sensei training him, Abito and Rin in it. Relatively easy when you had the right training and the right experience, even when it was raining shuriken and kunai, but Senban was another matter. He couldn't dwell too much on it, Zabuza was already gunning for him. Aku was already feeling the drain from the powerful jutsu and moved to perform the final hit. Sasuke, being caught unaware in the first attack, was still injured and in a lot of pain for the second barrage, but somehow after watching Kamei through pained half-lidded eyes, he could more or less copy her movements, angling and twisting his kunais, so they intercepted the sentence. Not as gracefully or as competently, his body wasn't as flexible for the style she was using, nor his muscles were used to doing those movements, and as much as it nodded him to admit. Kamei was slightly more agile too. In raw speed, he still had the advantage, but in pure reflexes, Kamei had the edge. His eyes could capture the senbans, but his body was too tired and injured to keep up, and ultimately he fell again with a yell of pain. Kamei was also at her limit, she could barely lift her arms, and this time more senbans hit her. Sasuke, get up, I think I have a way out of this mess, one of his eyes was shut, but the other red iris, with a single black coma. Sharingan. Kamei thought with a slightly amused huff. A second later and the powerful Dejutsu Keke Genkai, eye technique bloodline limit, would be useless, but as luck had it, the Yuzumaki only hoped that it could give them an edge. I'm all ears, he grunted and panted through the pain. Can you do a Kainten Jutsu, fire release technique? HN. Her left eye twitched at the non-response, but her gaze didn't leave the masked figure and speed up her explanation. Always whispering and using her hair to block their view, so their opponent wouldn't be able to read her lips in the very likely case he had this ability. I will take that as a yes. This Haku called his technique Hayuten, Ice Release, a Sushitsu Henka Keke Genkai, Nature Transformation Bloodline Limit, but did you notice how he stops for a few minutes between the attacks? I'm willing to bet he needs to gather and mold an absurd amount of chakra to keep those mirrors up and transmit his image to be able to attack from all of them at the same time. We need to counter in this break, but a single element against a Keke Genkai will be useless, I will do a few Tenjutsu, Wind Release Technique, to augment your Katen, this way, if we do it correctly and strongly enough, we will be able to overpower and break the mirrors. Sasuke lifted an eyebrow, not knowing that Kamei was able to perform Fuyutin Jutsus, but not at all surprised that she was able to analyze and plan a counter. What do you mean correctly? Just Kamei using this word was telling him that this wouldn't be his teammate blowing some air and him breathing fire, their attacks combining and voila. He also hurried in his question, taking the hint with the way his fellow Genin was rushing through the explanation that their time was running, and this Haku would begin attacking again. We have to give our respective techniques precisely the same amount of chakra, or else either of the two. You will burn me to death or nothing will happen. Fuyutin is weak against Katen because flames are fueled by air, on the other side of the coin, Hyotin is most probably Suetin, water release, and Fuyutin combined, and Katen is weak against Suetin, because water naturally extinguishes the heat. That's why, even though it is harder than if we used smaller amount, we need to pump all the chakra we can give, or else it also will be too weak to do damage against his eyes, since by definition it is already strengthened by Fuyutin. Sasuke nodded, impressed with her strategy, how will we know how much the other is giving to combine our techniques? You will be able to see, she almost hissed, incredulous that Sasuke didn't realize. What? For Kami's sake, Sasuke. 
you have the Sharingan. You have been using it since the beginning of the last strike. We don't have time for this, Kimei almost shouted seeing his shock, and that Haku and all of his reflections lifted even more sentiments. A lot more than in his last attacks, it seems that he is doing his last move. Please, don't resent me, the masked figure said almost dejectedly. Now, Sasuke. For the first time since meeting her, Kimei frantically yelled at him at the top of her lungs, knowing full well that neither her nor Sasuke would be able to walk away if Haku completed his offense. The blonde quickly let go of her kunais, letting them clang against the floor and started making hand seals. Moving their hands at an almost blind speed, both genins completed the hand seals at the same time. Sasuke desperately trying to watch and measure the amount of chakra Kamei was using and match it at the same time. If it wasn't for their current situation, the Achiha would scowl at his teammate's plan. It being a plan of genius or not, she basically commanded him to do all that as if it was the easiest thing in the world. A tiny voice in his head said that Kimei wouldn't have asked him if she thought he couldn't do it. Fortunately, all their chakra reserves were intact, not even having the chance to perform a jutsu before being inkissed in the ice dome, the only drawback being the pain from Haku's senbans that struck them, but it was too late for Haku himself. Duetin. Ditapa no jutsu. Wind release. Great breakthrough technique. Pain. Gakaku no jutsu. Fire release. Great fireball technique. Both genins shouted the names to the skies, too high on adrenaline and their nerves too raw to be worried about volume control. The chakra-laced wind picked up instantly and began to howl, so fast it was going in all directions, amazingly wiping all the mist from the bridge and leaving a bemused Mamachi Zabuza, Hada Kakashi and Hirano Sakura, whose views were clear just in time to gape at the scene again. But the enormous fireball that was bigger and more intense since Sasuke performed at last in their genin exam, also used the wind's power, going for its target, all the while getting bigger and bigger, more and more intense, that when it hit the mirror, the visage was that of a wave of fire. Miles away, people could feel the shockwave that sent Sakura and Tazuna to their asses hard and forced Kakashi and Zabuza to hastily shoot Chakra to their feet to avoid being in the same position. In the bridge, a heaving and exhausted Sasuke finally succumbed to unconsciousness, the senbin that Haku managed to throw, before the two Konohanin completed their jutsu sticking out of him. Heimei was panting, and eyes shut from debilitation, she never put so much chakra into a Fuyutin jutsu in such a stressful situation before, and she finally understood what Asuma sensei tried to explain about nature chakra being harder to control, and consequently harder not to let it go to waste than normal chakra, and that was with her reserves and specific training, no wonder Sasuke fainted. Both Jenin's clothes were thorn and sweaty, their hair a mess and damp from the mist, blood dripping from where a few of the thick needles were still in their flesh, however. In front of them was a giant crate, its diameter many times the size of their own bodies, lying in the middle, their opponent. His clothes singed and at the very least second degree burns here and there, his mask was slowly cracking from the blow that was so intense that it was more raw power than actual heat. Unreal, Zabuza muttered in shock, Kakashi wasn't faring much better, but of course that they could always count on Sakura to have the first reaction. Sasuke kun. Heimei flinched in annoyance, knowing that Sasuke was perfectly fine, just tired, in pain, and with a possible but mild C, chakra exhaustion, case perhaps fine was a bad description, but alive and considering the circumstances that was the best case scenario. Still trying to catch her breath, the blonde slowly approached the dawn boy that couldn't be so much older than her. Zabuza and I can't win against this girl Zabuza and I. Haku knew that this whole strategy was on the tiny blonde haired girl. She was the only one that managed to evade almost all of his sentence. She was also the one to figure his jutsu out. She was the one to come up with a way to win this fight. The mist was slowly covering the bridge again, only the sounds of Kakashi and Zabuza having shaken off their shocks and now battling again putting everyone on edge. Huffing and feeling sore everywhere, Kimei finally made it to the fake oinin, only to freeze as the last piece of his mask fell. You are that boy the fascinating stranger from yesterday went unsaid. Kimei didn't know what she was feeling. It wasn't as if people have never betrayed her trust after gaining it through acts of kindness, but this was a stranger from a foreign country, just this time Kimei thought that it would be okay if she clearly life was still trying to punch the lesson of never trusting people into her. Why did you stop? Haku asked, slowly and clearly painfully sitting up, wincing every now and then. I would have calmly killed you both. I the words wouldn't come out and for someone that was, at the same time so articulate and still learning how not to blurt out the first thought that comes to mind, it was a very new experience. Heimei was feeling anger. True anger. Not like one of her temper explosions that those brats in the academy sometimes elicited. She honestly thought, just for a few minutes that she could she didn't know what exactly she thought, but Kimei wasn't expecting this. Her vision was almost red and her hands were shaking, and she knew that it wasn't because of the fight that just took place. Aku just stared back at her. 
In the ninja world, there are these kinds of people ninjas that don't kill their enemies out of pity and let them escape with their lives but as kind as you are, I did not think you would be one of those kindness can sometimes be viewed as a weakness. When all the genin did was glare at him, Haku smiled a little. Tabuza san has no need for a weak shinobi, as it is you took away the reason for my existence. She flinched. What are you talking about? Her voice was still laced in fury making it a few octaves lower. Once, a long time ago, I also had people that were important to me. Hear me, Zabuza. Perhaps this is not your style, but I will finish this now. It was for a single second, but Kakashi would recognize the feeling anywhere. QB's chakra, for this one second he feared that Kamei's seal was breaking, the Jounin knew that he had to hurry his own fight. And then he shook his head, just where did Kamei learn how to do all this? As biased as the Academy Chuanins could be, sans Yumi no Ruka, Kakashi knew they wouldn't risk making an incomplete assessment of the student's skills. Disregarding all the derogatory comments about Kame since in just a week after meeting the girl, he knew to call them bullshit, there was no written notes anywhere about her ability to perform Fuitin Jutsus, nor about her borderline Chuanin level reflexes and armed combative skills. The Hokage would go berserk at the Academy instructors. Kakashi came to the conclusion that this was just a prejudice against the girl, even if he couldn't understand why she never used it in front of him, before realizing that first. She never got the chance since Kakashi has yet to spar or promote spars with his students and second. She must not have been as proficient back in the genin test. In another world, where the notorious prankster and the Achiha were always squabbling, the fight of two Kanoha genins against a high Chuanin almost Jounin level enemy would be pretty short until the Achiha fell in a death-like state, provoking his teammate enough into tapping the power he had sealed in him. But in this one, as a serious and avid reader that knew her every right, prompted her teammate into cooperating and had the training to do her part, having demanded the professional guidance she had the claim to as a newly turned genin, the fight was a lot more even. Although the blonde knew that this was more their enemy underestimating them and his weird compassion code, but as such, the fight was also a lot longer. In the world of the prankster Yuzumaki boy, Yuki Haku would already be dead when the greedy, shady, billionaire Gato and his army of hired samurai wanted thugs showed up, and Zabuza would be already be very weakened from his fight against Hata Kakashi. As it was. Beto, you scum. Zabuza grumbled under his breath, both his arms were broken and bleeding due to Kakashi's ninkin, ninja dogs, and he could see Haku and the tiny blonde Genin's attention at the sight of a short, fat, balding old man in a businessman's suit and black sunglasses. Sensing his depleted chakra reserves, his darkening vision due to severe blood loss and his beaten companion, Mamachi Zabuza, only had one final thing to say. It seems that we no longer have conflicting interests, had a Kakashi, to which the Kanoha Jounin only nodded. The Kanoha in having to catch his breath and tend to his many lacerations, and Haku you have been a good to a good partner, but I want you to stay in the bench for this one. The injured teenager blinked, horrified by the events taking place before him and unable to do anything because he could barely move with his wounds. Zabuza san. He tried to protest, but his master didn't even turn his head. I want you to live, do you hear me? Haku's lip trembled with the pent up emotions inside of him, but that was his master's voice and he managed to nod. Good. One day, I want you to find your own path, your own dream. With that, the famed Jounin turned to Kamei that stiffened a little at the attention she was getting from the powerful Kenjutsu, sword technique, master, hey, Gaki, brat, do you have a kunai? Raising an eyebrow, Kamei retrieved an unused one from the holster at her thigh and threw it at him, that despite his pain, managed to catch it with his teeth of all things, Kakashi, Gato is mine. But those last words, Zabuza entered the fray. In spite of the great celebrations that took place a mere hour ago, Tazuna's house was silent. Not a gloomy one or even a tense one, just silent. Almost serene. As soon as Haku is fit to travel, we will be leaving, Kakashi announced. The bandages that were wrapped around his torso and arms, nothing did to diminish the effects of his aloof attitude, his nose still buried in the orange book that thank heavens, Tsunami-san didn't know what it was about. So soon. Inari almost whined, looking at Kimei with pleading eyes. The look made the genin freeze, uncomfortable and unused with people showing so much affection for her, but the blonde managed to give him a small, apologetic smile. The exchange completely baffled the other two Kanoha genin, but Kimei was too busy fretting in her mind to pay attention, at the speed Haku's healing was going she needed to act now if she wanted to even use her knowledge about the law of conquest. Finishing her meal, said genin stood and addressed Kakashi. Haddock san, Kakashi really didn't think he will ever manage to suppress the wince that having someone call him like that caused. Yes Kame. I need to absent myself for a few hours today. Also, I shall heal Yuki-san to the best of my abilities once I return. 
figuring that there was no way Kamei could get herself into a trouble she wouldn't be able to get out of in a country that doesn't have a military force, Kakashi just shrugged, but the rest of her speech caught up to him. You have medical training. A bit. Kamei also shrugged in return. Nothing that would save a life, but it would speed up the process with Yuki-san, whose injuries are relatively superficial, even if in worse condition than yours. Humming, Kakashi only brushed it off and nodded, remembering the high organ, military ration pill. I'm going to miss you, Kamei Nichin. Inari said with a blush. The blonde paused when adjusting her bag and looked down at the short eight-year-old. Aside from Konohimaru, she was not accustomed to have kids treating her so respectfully well, affectionately was a better word for it. He was still somewhat of a brat, but the dull brown eyes that were there when they first met were now replaced by a fire that even impressed Kamei. Smiling softly, she reached down and softly brushed the end of his bangs with her fingertips not touching his skin at all, but the gesture only made the boy blush harder. As I will miss you, she admitted in return. Since the battle at the bridge, the child was has been very sweet. Behaving like a child should be behaving. Even if Kamei had to admit that Tsunami-san and Tazuna-san's gratefulness at her in specific was a little uncomfortable. It seemed that Tsunami-san wasn't going to forget her few words to her son so soon and made sure to tell her father about it, too and Tazuna-san in turn told everybody else in the city the reason his grandson managed to convince the downtrodden people of Nami, Wave, to stand. Up again. With a slight wave from Kamei and Sakura, Team 7 turned around and began to walk away. Noticing Haku's slumped posture and trying to comfort and at the same time encourage the teen, Kamei put her hand in his shoulder. Even when mourning for the death of his master and teacher, the kind boy still smiled at the strange and precocious girl that, right now, was the only reason he was not breaking. Nah, Kakashi-sensei. Sakura's voice was strangely subdued, the girl still a little shaken from the terrifying fight she witnessed. Hmm? I don't understand. Why was Abusa gunning for Tazuna-san? She sent a nervous look to Haku that was walking a little behind with Kamei beside him, but he didn't seem to be paying attention. Even if that didn't mean he wasn't listening. Because he was hired to. Kakashi turned another page from his orange book. Why? Why would he agree to do something like that? Sakura frowned. In the future, you will also be performing missions that are not honorable. Outright cowardly and, sometimes, infinitely worse than what Abusa agreed to do. His voice was solemn, even if his posture was still in slouch and his nose still buried in porn. Why? Alarmed green eyes turned to him. Bakashi would have chuckled if it wasn't for the topic. Such a novice. Because we are ordered to do so. Okage-sama would never. Okage-sama's body count is thousands times greater than that of Mamachi's abuses. He did not survive all three great ninja wars because he was merciful. When all Sakura did was widen her eyes, pale-faced, Kakashi sighed. The ninja world isn't a place for the faint of heart. That is why many prefer to kill it, lest it be their condemnation. He looked up a little. I still don't understand. Haku, Kamei and Sasuke looked at the pink-haired girl with varying degrees of pity. They knew that the world was a bloody place even without ninjas. For someone that led such a pampered and sheltered life like Sakura, the shinobi world was a harsh reality to face, to even understand. Why ninjas have a whole regulation that orders them to kill their feelings. Because feelings get in the way, they impair your ability to make rational decisions, they make you naive in a world that is kill or be killed. Many don't have the heart to kill their enemies, and yet, the same cannot be said of those enemies. What do you think the result would be? Sakura was quiet for a long time. Pale, shivering and deeply sad. Was that her future? Was that what she signed up for? Do we really need to do that? Live as if we are not even human beings. Ninjas are not supposed to seek a reason to exist. We are supposed to be tools of our villages, living weapons with someone else in charge of the trigger. Obey without questioning, this is military dictatorship. Sakura seemed about to cry. However, she snapped her head back hopefully, it is only the theory. After all, we are still humans, so when facing this kind of situation, we suffer, that's why we are called shinobi. Those who endure. Sakura just bowed her head, sad and fearful again. Clearly that was far from the comforting word she expected, but Kakashi wasn't about to coddle her, better learn now than to die later because of it. Sasuke only spared a glance towards Kakashi, and Kamei gave a discreet and small half-smile. Those who endure indeed. She allowed her eyes to close for a few seconds and took a deep breath. In a week's time, she would be back in Kanoha, she couldn't fault that hellhole for that. Kanoha taught her how to endure. If she wanted to truly live, she needs to survive first. Hey, father, we still need to name the bridge. Tsunami reminded the old man that was still watching the Kanoha entourage with a fond gaze, more precisely the light blue swirl that was on the back of the yellow battle kimono of a blonde-haired genin. And what about the Great Kamei Bridge? 
they may stood her ground in the face of all the heads of every single ninja Ichizoku clan that Kanoha housed, the representatives of every major branch, the elders and the civilian council. That alone should have told the three civilians' representatives that she wasn't just some kid playing ninja. Should being the imperative word. But those are the people that moved the village. Twelve ninja clans currently led by Aburam Shaibi, Akamichi Chauza, Hada Kakashi, Haiwuga Hiyashi, Inuzuka Tsum, Kurama Ankai his niece's proxy, Nara Shikaku, Suratobi Hirazan, Senju Tsuna Day currently absent, Shimura Danzo, Ichiha Saz who, like the Kurama heiress, was too young, but he didn't have a proxy and Yamanaka Inoichi. Three civilian representatives whose names Kamei never bothered to learn. Then the heads of the many shinobi divisions. The head of the T&I, Torture and Interrogation, Marino Ibiki, the Anbu General Akunoichi with purple hair with a Tora tiger mask, for one second Kamei thought that this was the Anbu that gave her the little pack of watermelon seeds, back when she was six. But this Kunoichi was a lot taller and her hair a lot longer, and the Kunoichi back then was already a teenager, so it was unlikely that she would grow up this much, the head of the Irionin, Medic Nin, Force was a grey-haired Kunoichi with quite the severe expression, and in her sixties, the head of the intelligence division was Yamanaka Inoichi, the Jounin commander Nara Shikaku. And the Chuanin figure a face that Kamei honestly never thought she would see in this middle. Yumino Ruka. She almost gaped at his slightly sheepish expression before remembering herself. Then the Hokage advisors slash elders. Mitakado Himura, Shimura Danzo and Yudatane Kaharu, finally the Sandame Hokage, Siratobi Hirazan. Kamei knew that the head that hold a position that would warrant a place in the council are only granted a single vote in the big schemes, such as Nara Shikaku, Yamanaka Inoichi and the Hokage himself. Aside from the Hokage for obvious reasons, when this happened, the clan head position has priority, since it was a pretty much lifelong duty, unlike being the head of a division that could easily be passed to someone else. Not surprising there was empty sits. Four in a circle of chairs that were clearly the row of the clan heads, the Senju, the Ichiha, the Siratobi ones, the Lee clan head was currently just out of town. One in the ninja branch's representatives, being the Hokage advisor. Shimura Danzo. The sits were arranged in a semicircle and a step above the only unmarked chair, the civilian's row being the lowest, then the ninja's representatives, followed by the clan heads, and finally the Hokage, flanked by the elders, that were a single step below the village's leader, clearly in an attempt to intimidate the guest. They made that was sitting in the only unmarked one, Haku standing behind her more or less in a state of shock at a relaxed stance in front of so many powerful figures, political or otherwise, she just treated the three civilians like she treated every single civilian that mistreated her. She didn't even acknowledge their existence besides the thought of a temporary nuisance that was best avoided like a mosquito, in answer they sneered at her. Hirazin cleared his throat. I called this meeting on behalf of Jen and Yuzumaki Kamei, in regards of her request for citizenship for the Mizu no Kuni, water country, resident, Yuki Haku. And what makes the Jen and Yuzumaki Kamei think that she has any rights? One of the civilians almost spat. Sandame, if I may have the word. Kamei requested respectfully, just emphasizing the civilian representative's mistake in the chain of command, said man gulped and paled, risking a glance toward the Hokage, whose glare was enough to make him cower in fear. Not even counting the hard stares that every ninja in the room sent him. Old man or not, the second shinobi no Kami, god of ninja, earned the name for a reason. Granted but he almost bit his tongue when he saw the glint in the sapphire blue eyes, he also saw the reactions of the other ninjas, the last time they saw it was in the eyes of their yandame, and it never ended well for the recipient. Completely ignoring the idiotic civilian's words as if he never spoke in the first place, the blonde looked squirrely into the sandame's eyes. I invoke the ride as the proxy for head of the Yuzumaki Ichizoku that allied themselves with Kanahagakur in the Founders' era to use the law of conquest to demand that Yuki Haku, defeated by my hands in combat during an official mission, be named as a valuable asset and vassal of the clan. Such a serious and life-altering word spoken in a 12-year-old girl's voice would be comical in any other occasion. They may just crossed her legs and daintily rested her hands in her lap, calmly waiting as the uproar took place and the Hokage tried to restore order. The second they returned to the village, Anbu were escorting them directly to the Hokage Tower, where after the vocal report and Haruno Sakura and Ichiha Sasuke being sent home, Kamei fearlessly took a step forward and asked the Hokage to call a S-rank council meeting. As a registered Kanoichi of Kanoha, Jenin or not, she had all the right to demand it, and the Hokage nothing could do that particularly law should be a lot more restricting. Oh, well. Silence. The sand aim finally had it, letting loose enough Kai, killer intent, to knock a civilian unused to such a thing right out. But Hokage-sama, you can't allow. I said silence he almost hissed at the interruption, the civilian woman quickly nodded now, Kamei, I think you are going to have to allow us a few questions. 
Such as what do you mean Yuzumaki Ichizoku there is no such a thing, you do you Brad a civilian quickly back paddled when in face of the Hokage's warning glare. If I may. Kimei was actually having a lot of fun, who knew that studying so deeply into politics would be so useful so fast. She almost smiled at the face the civilian made when he realized that he made the same bluff. The word is yours one more strike, and Suratobi would fly off the handle on his throat. For anyone older than 20, they would easily remember this, or if they bothered to study fairly recent history at that. A little more than 20 years ago, the Yuzumaki were originated from Yuzushiagakur in Yuzu no Kuni, Whirlpool Country, needless to say, they were quite the prominent clan. Due to their abilities in Fuinjutsu, sealing techniques, Kiri, Mist, Iwa, Rock, Taki, Waterfall, and Tani, River, united their forces in an attack against Yuzushiagakur, for fearing the clan's skills in the most difficult ninja art. Regardless of Kanoha's ignorance concerning their survivors, long before the event, a young Kanoichi in training that was unregistered in Yuzushiagakur ninja forces, moved to Kanoha. And so, her transition to become Kanoha's citizen was undeterred, she went by the name of Yuzumaki Kashina, as an ironic twist, she was the oldest daughter of the clan heir, then she took out a thick folder that she was sitting on much to the amusement of a few ninjas. Here, you have the birth certificate of Yuzumaki Kashina and here, my own. You see, for me to bear the Yuzumaki name, a noble clan name, independently of the country they originated being destroyed or not, I would need blood links to the clan, since name theft is considered one of the most heinous acts of treason in Hai no Kuni. That being said, imagine my surprise when I learned that Yuzumaki Kashina was my mother. As many of you should know, differently from head position, since it can be passed when the current head deems his or her heir ready to shoulder the duty, or in case of death, the clan's council would determine if the heir is ready or a new head in case he or she does not have heirs. The only way for heir station to be passed, bar the heir forfeiting the claim, unfortunately, is by death, in that case the oldest child of the lineage would automatically receive the full status, in fewer words, it means that the day my late grandfather died was also the day that my mother was named heiress and, subsequently, Troublesome the lazy drawl was so familiar that for a second Kamei thought that Shikamaru was there, but she allowed herself a brief moment of amusement when she realized that it was his father, Shikaku, that finished her speech for her, the day your mother died, you received full heiress status and all the rights and entitlements that comes with it, that way. As the heiress and proxy of the Yuzumaki clan that is allied with Konoha, even if the clan itself isn't Konoha's, you are in full rights to demand a law that is both only applicable to ninja clan members with alliance to the village and directly related to the head's family. Aku had to suppress a snort of amusement as the second shouting match took place before their eyes, and Kamei only uncrossed her legs to stretch them and cross her ankles, an almost lethargic expression on the tanned face, as if she was about to fall asleep at any second. It seems that he chose well his new master, she was training hard to acquire new skills, but it was the first time Haku was seeing a political struggle, and Kamei was no slouch, giving trouble to men and women many times her age. The day after Zabuza killed Gato and basically half the army he took with him to the bridge, Haku was lying in the futon that Izuna's family had graciously provided, so he could rest from his injuries when he felt Kamei's presence. He was no Kanchi Taipu, sensor, but it was really hard no to considering her massive chakra reserves, he could also feel it when she got out of the house a few hours earlier, and for whatever reason, her team didn't accompany her. He couldn't be a factor. Haku literally couldn't get up. She politely knocked in the door, but even when he didn't answer, she slowly opened it. I wanted to check your wounds and see if you want to eat anything she graciously knelt beside him. Haku was too tired, too sore, in too much pain in all the senses of the word to properly answer. His mater's death too raw and too recent for him not feel like his extremities were breaking, and at any second it would reach his chest, and it would be all over. The blonde girl sighed, sadness and sympathy in her aristocratic and exotic features. I won't pretend to understand what you're going through right now. As much as you have all the right to grieve the death of someone that was so important to you, taking Zabuza Sen's last words as basis, I don't think he would want you to keep doing it. Aku was almost glaring, but when he opened his mouth, Kamei only hurried. Perhaps not now, or even any time soon. But how many ninjas' deaths are overlooked or even seen as completely unimportant collateral damages, if anything even I, an unassociated enemy of Mamachi's Zabuza, would like to honor his last wishes as unorthodox as the theme of honor is for a ninja, I believe it is important for you as well. The Keke Genkai wielder looked shocked at her words, before he could stop himself, Haku was laughing himself silly, his elegant and graceful voice the loudest he ever allowed it in his entire life, he didn't even know why he was laughing, but somehow it was freeing, he thought he also heard a tinkle of bells, but when he controlled himself, Kamei was only watching him. The only sign of her amusement was slight quirk in the corner of her lips. You are an unorthodox Kanoichi yourself, Yuzumaki Kamei. Her smile widened just the tiniest bit before she replied good-naturedly. 
And you don't have any room to say so, Yuki Haku. Haku smiled once again before sobering and staring at the blonde, almost thoughtfully. What about you? Do you have a dream of your own? Her smile dropped a little, but she didn't seem sad, her gaze was more searchingly than anything else, and Haku had the distinct impression that he was being measured with a frame he had no way of knowing and therefore, no hope of even pretending to show what she wanted to see. Finally, Kimei sighed, but by her expression, Haku was pretty sure that this was more the gen in thinking whatever than plainly trusting him, which was more than fair, considering that they only met two days ago. He was willing to bet that she only thought that he couldn't do evil with the information either way. Since I became a genin, I was forced to reevaluate several aspects of my life by several different people, and she sent him a pointed look, and Haku only manage a slightly sheepish look in return, I do not think that it's a bad thing, it's just a little uncomfortable. I suppose that I wasn't truly living, I was just navigating through life's motions all the while trying not to participate in it, while my plans wait for the right time. My dream also changed in the meantime you probably don't know that, but I too am a member of a basically extinct clan. As she expected, this surprised Haku that never heard of an Yuzumaki Ichizoku before, but that was not what caught his attention. Basically. He echoed, puzzled by chosen word. There is a high chance of a sizable number of survivors. My dream is to one day track them down and, if they want, to reunite my family members once again, but this time around I'd protect them. Haku still smiled at the conviction in the sapphire blue eyes and still had to stifle a laugh at the shocked expression in her face once he stated that she was his new master mistress after about five minutes of silence. But he meant every word. In exchange, her conviction was his, he would do anything to see that her dream bear fruits, but keeping in mind his last promise to Zabuza-san, he would have a dream of his own, but first things first. They need to get the council to accept him in Kanoha. Back to the present, the three civilians were already purple-faced, a few of the heads were arguing among themselves about who knows what, and the Hokage was rubbing his throbbing temples. Silence. Much to the amusement of a quite a few heads, this jolted Kamei awake from where she was dozing, Yuzumaki Kamei is in her full right to give voice to such a law. But, you can't possibly. I won't repeat myself again his voice didn't rise, but the warning was clear, the three civilians almost shook under the pressure. As for the majority of the ninjas. Many of the clan heads actually knew said woman since they were children. In Yuzukatsum being hit the hardest, she really enjoyed Kashina's company, and even considered the blunt and boisterous Riti a very good friend. To know that the tiny girl she ignored at best already knew who her mother was, really waited in her conscience. Tsum never intended to be so absent in the life of a girl that needed so much help, it's just the village had just been almost destroyed, her friend was dead, and many of her clansmen also died, but the wild woman knew that, in the end of the day. Those are only excuses she almost fell off her chair when saw Kamei wearing that yellow kimono, a quick glance around the room, and the rest of her peers were feeling the same. Ada Kakashi being the only one unaffected, already knowing that his student knew that part of her heritage, but being unwilling to be the one to get the cat completely out of the bag with the other half, even if the more logical and smarter members for sure figured it out by now. He chanced a glance toward Shikaku and Shibi. Kamei wasn't ready yet to face her father's enemies, and as far as Kakashi was concerned, the Yuzumaki half was the worst kept secret that he has ever seen, and that was including the joke of the S rank QB1. Actually it wasn't even a secret. People never put two and two together about her mother because they didn't want to. As Kamei said, name theft was considered one of the biggest acts of treason in their country, so he didn't even know what to think about the people that didn't connect Yuzumaki Kashina with Yuzumaki Kamei. Really. A little more than 10 years equals memory loss. It wasn't like Kashina san hid in a hole through her entire pregnancy her 10 months long pregnancy. With all due respect, Hokage Sama for the first time since the meeting started, Shimura Danzo spoke, and Kamei was immediately on guard. The famed war hawk wasn't just someone that rivaled the Sandame for nothing, along with the other two elders, they managed to fight and survive all three great shinobi wars, but I believe that Yuki san cannot possibly be a Konoha citizen, considering his affiliation with Kiri, Mist. May I, Sandame? Here is an almost sight again, it seemed that the only reason he was even in the room was to give voice to the ones that bothered to ask, so far only Kamei and oddly enough Danzo, and damn if the Sandane wasn't almost gagging for putting them both in the same sentence, or to shut everyone up, he nodded warily Yuki-san was never a Karigaku shinobi or even citizen. Mamachi's Zabuza took him in and trained him in the ninja's arts, correct, but by then, Mamachi's Zabuza was no longer affiliated with his former village, already branded as a Nukunin. Therefore, there is no law that prevents Yuki-san into joining a clan affiliated with Konoha, and we will have no issues with the current Mizuka Gay, should he or she decide to take any actions which would be unlikely due to the Kekei Genkai purges. 
However even if, in time, a new Mizukage emerges and decides the Kanoha shouldn't, for all the effects, hold a member of the Yuki Ichizoku, he or she will not be able to demand anything, seeing that the Yuki Ichizoku never got into Kiri's forces, even if the clan was originated in Mizu no Kuni, water country. As for provoking them into war. It would be years down the line before they have healed themselves to possess any kind of sizable manpower. No one would be so suicidal in these circumstances to risk it, Yuki-san being the last confirmed member or not. It seemed that the members of the council were finally realizing that Yuzumaki Kame wasn't some defenseless and easily intimidated genin. Even Shimura Danzo looked at her with a new glint in his eyes, Kame almost dared to call it something close to respect. Marino Ibiki smirked at her, more than impressed. The civilians were fuming, but then again, when they were ever satisfied when a ninja got their way. And the ones that knew her mother were at the same time proud and sad. People never went out of their way to help the girl that was still just a child however she was proving to the most powerful in one way or another people in the village that she no longer needed anyone's help. The best they could for her now that it was too late was to get out of her way. The Sandame also realized that. I grant Yuzumaki Kame, heiress of the Yuzumaki Ichizoku, ally of Kanoha, the use of the law of conquest rights. Haku of the Yuki Ichizoku was bested in battle by a mainliner of a clan allied with Kanahagakur, and therefore said clan member has the right to invoke the aforementioned law. This matter is closed despite the terrible migraine that he would get in mere minutes, Hiruzen couldn't help but laugh at the mocking polite smile that Kimei sent everyone in the room. No one noticed Danzo's almost smile, Hayuga Hiyashi's contemplative looker in Yuzuka Tsum's sad one. Kamei took her time getting up, taking back the two birth certificates, and motioned to the exit, Haku apparently took the meaning of that to open the door for her, to which the blonde only responded with an discreet exasperated look, Haku only stared back, but there was amusement in his brown eyes. Which only brought his attention to one thing. How did she get her mother's birth certificate? Her own was easy enough, she only had to go to the hospital and request a copy, since it was hers anyway, but direct descendant or not, Kamei would have to give the exact name to be given her mother's documents. My guess it's time to take a closer look. The thought only made the Hokage cringe, he should have take a closer look since day one. In all honesty if it was anyone else, he would just get the papers, sign and stamp it, and they would be sent in their merry way, this was just another prejudice against her that he always neglected to curb. What is the meaning of this? One of the civilians hissed. How is that the demon has a clan? Silence. Here is an hissed back, yes, Yuzumaki Kame is the heiress of our ally, Yuzumaki clan, that has never been hidden. What does it mean for Kanoha, now that she has reclaimed her status? Shikaku asked before the seething civilians could continue their tantrum. No one wanted that. They turned to the Hokage, also wanting to know the answer. First of all. She never lost it, second of all. Nothing because she never lost it. He got up and walked out of the room. They were calmly walking for some time now, it was getting late, and neither had a single second of rest since they arrived in Kanoha. Kimei barely able to get the documents before the Hokage summoned the council. Still tired, sweaty and disheveled from the travel and the rather extended mission, Yuki Haku and Yuzumaki Kamei were serenely taking their time, well, Kamei was, Haku was just following her because he honestly had no idea where to even go, he just assumed they were heading towards the girl's house. He was proven correctly, but no training whatsoever could keep him from gawking. The walls were huge and visibly a little old, like they spent a long time neglected, but recently someone took the job of restoring it to themselves, there were seals everywhere, intricate and powerful. Absently biting her thumb and smearing the blood in the seals, Kamei waited the gates to open before turning to him with a speculative glance that made Haku squirm. Look, I did all this because even if unknowingly you helped me, in a way I never thought I would be or even could be helped so this is me saying. Thank you, however that doesn't necessarily mean that you need or should swear loyalty to Kanoha. As far as I was able to understand it, your affiliation with the Yuzumaki Ichizoku is more than enough to protect you at least politically saying what I'm trying to say, is this is your last shot to take off running for the hills Haku blinked. This was not what he was expecting, then again, he was beginning to understand that he shouldn't really expect much of anything when Kamei was concerned. I will stay, as long as you do, as long as you will have me the blonde only chuckled. Your one weird friend. Just as long as I am your friend. The powerful bloodline user masked his surprise well. In his head he would be a tool or a servant, like he was Abusa Sans, yet, Kamei called him a friend, he would freely admit to anyone that asked that having someone like Kamei as a friend would be an honor. But the smile he followed after the first friend he ever had inside the protective walls of the Yuzumaki compound. One thing that Siratobi Hiruzen never managed to learn in his two reigns as the political and military leader of the strongest of the shinobi Gadakoku, five great shinobi nations, was that the happenings inside the council chambers, regardless of what they were, hardly stayed a secret. 
he should have learned when he tried to minimize damage and never turned public, why the Nidame Hokage, Senju Tabarama, was dead, and a week later every single Kanoha citizen was calling for Kumo's blood. He should have learned when, already a Hokage, he tried to secretly take on a Genin team, but didn't want anyone to know lest people accuse him of playing favorites, and then there were angry parents in his doorstep, demanding to know why their kids weren't good enough for him the day after graduation. He should have learned when the most promising of his students turned into a Nukunin, missing ninja, after experimenting in dozens, almost hundreds of little kids, and not a small number of them were from prominent clans that were demanding compensation for their lost members, and the world knew a few days later. He should definitely have learned when he revealed how exactly the Yandame defeated the QB, and then there were thousands of people calling for a newborn baby's blood, before he even figured out a way of explaining what happened to the rest of the villagers. Alas. What is the meaning of this? The demon having a clan. That little whore, I should have known that she was up to something. And the comments only got worse as the day progressed much to the horror of the Hokage that knew the repercussions should word get back to Kamei. Aware of her title and clearly aware of the village's politics, she would be in her full right to demand the blood of anyone who smeared her name or her clans. Talking trash in mid-fight was a given, but civilians dragging a clan member or their names through mud was a guaranteed and legal literal slit throat. It seemed that the girl was familiar with the privileges her status provided her and all the laws protecting every registered citizen of Kanohas, and the only reason Kamei didn't tell anyone nor used what she knew was because she saw no reason for it. She evaded her attackers, got around the people trying to overcharge her, and just kept going with her life, ignoring everyone just as everyone ignored her. Now, she finally had a cause to use all her political skills, a neglectful teacher for starters and just a taste, but the brunt was shown when protecting her friend, Haku, and therefore Kamei was unleashing her strategical mind and unsuspecting but deserving victims that only thought of her as some gen and not worthy of attention. Oh, boy. Kamei calmly hummed while collecting enough rice beams to make meals for the week. Haku a few yards away was plucking a few fruits, Kakashi said that it would take them a while to get another C-rank, considering the disaster that happened in their last and first. Oh, she was well aware of the slander she was suffering, but as long as it didn't interfere with any aspects of her life, why should she care? No one was doing anything new anyway. Heimei sama Right that. She really needs to get Haku to stop calling her that. As Kamei followed the reasoning that people should earn their titles, she also prefers to be called by something she earned. Being polite was an obligation, and so the suffix an was a given for her. But Sama was the utmost respect someone can be called, and, in her mind, being a clan heiress and proxy of the head meant very little in terms of respect. After all, the only thing she needed to do in this stance was being born, even defeating him in battle, shouldn't earn such a title, or else the ninja world would be screwed with everyone calling everyone Sama, so by allowing Haku to call her that sounded so undeserving. For him and for her. But doesn't matter what she say, the teenager was undeterred. At least she got him to stop calling her Kamei Haim and goddamn public, she also tried to hide her smirk whenever Haku slipped and called her only Kamei, never happened even once outside of the clan's walls, but she'd take what she could. Yes Haku. I just wanted to compliment you once again for your very successful crops, as a former farmer myself, I know that nurturing so many different kinds of comestibles is not easy. Oh, thanks, I guess once she returned from mission in Nami, wave, there was a lot to, weeds here and there, but her crops were strong and healthy. Heimei still shook her head in disbelief whenever she remembered the guy's reaction to the knowledge she was a Jinchuriki. She saw it fit since Haku was pledging himself to her that he knew everything he was getting into before it became irreversible, not that it wasn't already, but he didn't need to know that, and she didn't need to act on it. The prejudice, the attacks, the sabotage, everything, since he was likely to be treated the same way once his relation to her was revealed. The only thing he did when Kamei told him about her status as Yinchuriki was wait with an expectant expression, as if she didn't finish talking. Damn. It was only when she was explaining the repercussions that he expressed anger, indignation and even disdain for Kanoha's populace, and Kamei had to hurry in the measurements she took to have a relatively healthy life. How buying food directly from the market was a bad idea either for the pocket or for the health, and as for books in general, she only needed to go to the clan's library, since the Yuzumaki were apparently packrats. Seriously, the huge building had everything from comics to romantic novels to the most obscure knowledge in the ninja arts and whatever else that it didn't have, chances are no one else did either. Minus one about Kanoha's politics since the members of her clan that lived here didn't deem it necessary to have one about it since they lived and allied themselves to Kanoha. Ah, innocence. At one point it stops being cute. She got the copy she had doing a henja copying it from the library. I need to go meet my team. Today our break for recovery is over, and our missions and Haddock's version of training is going to restart. 
I also need to see my requested teachers and report the progress I made by myself, did you already finished the formularies I gave you, so you could be a registered Kanoha citizen? She asked once they finished reaping their meal for the week and returned to the main house, Kame putting the grains in big glass jars, so she could peel them later, and Haku putting the fishes in the fridge with half of the fruits and the other half in the fruit bowl in the low table. Four weeks ago, Team 7 went into a C-turned A rank mission, three weeks ago they faced Mamachi's abuser for the first time, and a two weeks ago, Kame and Sasuke faced Haku, while Kakashi fended Zabuza off. As Kame was the only one standing, Haku having fainted once he saw his master about to sacrifice himself, she was the winner of that particular fight. And a week ago, Team 7 arrived in Kanoha with a plus one. Yes, here they are he pointed to a thick paper pile on the low kitchen table. A week ago, Kame made a quick tour with Haku in the Uzumaki grounds and offered any room in the main house, obviously and, in his head logically, Haku chose one in the opposite corridor, just to the right of her own quarters, the main one. Figuring that any children or family members she might have in the future would use the ones in the main corridor and, as a vassal, he should get the physically closest in case of an emergency, but also not trespassing, something told him that Kame knew what he was doing by the tired look she sent him. He would never tell her that, but aside from his genuine respect for her, Haku was just amused by her reactions. He was impressed by his new home and amazed by her plantation. Kame nodded to him and took an equally thick paper pile from under the table and added it to his. Ah, Kame-sama. Yes. What? These are the papers detailing other aspects of the law of conquest I acquired, a little more than just, well, you on the mission to Nami, wave. That is expectant and curious look, the blonde only sighed. Earlier that day when I went to talk to you, I tracked Gato's trail and went to his headquarters, as greedy as he was, Gato was also moderately paranoid, and so he also had with him great part of his monetary possessions. You stole it Haku finished with wide eyes. Part of the reasons Abusa Sen even accepted the job was the ridiculous amount of money Gato was offering as payment. Yes. I heard of Gato Company, Kanoha actually has a bit of info about him. Shipping, importation and exportation is a decoy of his business and smuggling drugs and other illegal products such as people. I saw an opportunity and struck. Since the law of conquest only required a council meeting for living conquests, I only had to fill in the paperwork for any objects that caught my eye in a mission, money falls under that category. She shrugged but carefully eyed Haku's incredulous form, but when the shock passed, the pretty brunette giggled, I have yet to tell you this, even though I already thought it, but, in my opinion, I chose really well my new master. A mayor rolled her eyes but smiled at him for the compliment, taking the pile of papers and thanking Haku when he alerted that he would prepare dinner. Using the dark corners and the less traveled routes, Kame got to the Hokage Tower, ignoring the whisperings that weren't there the last time, enter. Oh, hello Kame, I see that young Haku already finished the paperwork, and Harrison glared at the tall pile by his right, it was probably taller than he was. Which okay he wasn't the tallest man in the world, but still. Yes, and here are my own for the other part of the Law of Conquest. Other part. Yes, there are a few objects that caught my attention and that I fancied in the mission, since the previous owner was an enemy that Team 7 defeated, I just claimed it. Seeing no way that this could give him more of headache with the council, the sand aim only nodded and took the papers from her, already knowing that young Haku had in his possession the famous Kubakirabacho, decapitating carving knife, his late master's sword, and assuming that this is what that was about. Oh boy, if only he knew. Thanks for watching guys. Hope you all are enjoyed this video. If you do please leave a like share and subscribe also don't forget to support author of this fanfic. So let's end this video here. Until then see you in next video.